Good morning. Welcome to Life Water Community Church. If you could find a seat after you grab your coffee, that would be great. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Happy Mother's Day. We got something for you today, but I'll tell you that in a second. Awesome. <laughs> um, if you're visiting with us for the first time or if you're joining us online for the first time, go to our website. You can fill out a connection card. We would love to connect with you this morning. Um, and if you're a regular tender, pull out your phone to your phone app and register your attendance, if you could, please. Uh, we like to keep track of that and uh, figure out who's doing what. A couple quick announcements. Men. Yeah. Softball game this week, Tuesday, 8, 10 p.m. We love cheerleaders, so please come on out, ladies, and uh, support your men's softball team. want to let you know, too, starting in June, June 5th, the Life Water Academy is joining the team. This is your opportunity if you've been coming to church for a while and uh, you're trying to figure out what's sort of your next step. Uh, this would be a next step where you can find out um, sort of our story, uh, how the church started, find out what we believe in, what we're passionate about, uh, find out uh, how you can impact your world, and also to discover what your spiritual gifts are and how you can minister. So if this is something you're interested in, you can actually go to our website or to your phone app and you can register, join in the team. I'd love to have you do that. That's four Sundays, June 5th through June 26th, from noon to 1.15. All right, so mothers, uh, we want to give a special um, honor that's so do you. I mean, where would we be, men, dads, uh, if it wasn't for moms? And so we have... A special humorous kind of video to show you in honor of mom. So let's show that now. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look, an empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed. You're just going to sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull out our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Hey, I'm gonna hop in the shower. Does somebody wanna come use the bathroom while I'm in here? All right, happy Mother's Day. We, we definitely appreciate you, uh, ladies. And so we have a special gift for you. Uh, if you're 18 or older, we'd love to have you to go back there and, and take, one, take advantage of that. Just a special thank you from LifeWater uh, for moms. So appreciate that very much. All right, well, let's stand. Let's read the scripture together this morning. It's out of Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. And you notice uh, 
Kim did an excellent job. There's a little arrow there telling me there's two slides, all right? So I won't look completely foolish. Here we go, nice and loud. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So you can sort of get the gist of where we're going this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the stage that you've given to us. Thank you for moms. Thank you for what they have done for us and the sacrifices they have made. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for them and want to give them honor and glory on this day. And so, Lord, we are so thankful for that. Lord, we're also thankful for you, God, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to come to this earth to die for us and rise again on the third day. And it's through that that we get our, our hope, um, the light that we keep moving forward, Lord. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that joy. Thank you for that peace that you offer to us. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, we like to do meet and greet. If you don't recognize somebody, go up and introduce yourselves. If you recognize everybody in the building, go up and hug somebody. continue to want to dance up here. I want to let you know that dancing is not limited just to children. So if any of you adults would like to dance, you're welcome to come up as well. Or put on a groove at your seat. We're okay with it here. I I got the devil on my throat. I got blood on my hands. Ones that I love are in danger.
for many a month now since Camp Blast. Uh, so if you don't like this one, you can blame my daughter, Addie. But the Lord, <laughs> but the Lord is, is moved, and we actually really enjoy this. So I hope it, it moves you quite like it moved Addie. So uh, this is a good one.
Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you guys can have a seat. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So, um, for those of you who are on Instagram, there's this fun trend going around called the Mandela Effect. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It was a fun game where two pictures that look extremely similar but slightly different pop up on the screen, and you have a brief second to pick which one's the right one. So I thought it'd be fun if Kim could bring up a slide. We could play that game here just for a quick second. I promise this will tie in. So we have two pictures, and kids, you're going to have to help me out on this, of Pikachu. One has a black tail, one has a yellow tail. Which one's right? It is the yellow tail. If you missed that, that's okay. I missed that one as well. I can't believe you kids got that wrong, you Pokemon fans. No, nope, it's yellow. Rudy, I knew you'd get it right. All right, we have one more, one more. For those of you who are 90s kids, you may recognize this book. Is it spelled with an E or is it spelled with an A? And I'm not going to pronounce it because I don't want to give it away. E or A? E. E. <laughs> tricky, tricky. It is an A. I never would have guessed that. I got both those wrong. Anyway, um, you could just leave that up for me, Kim, if you would. What does this have to do with anything? All right, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. You told me it's going to have to do with it, it does, I promise you. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians 11:14, it says, And Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And I look at these pictures and I think, what a perfect symbolic representation of how our enemy can take something that is truth and change it ever so slightly to fool people who are even Christians. And I see this all the time in different things. And for example, we're talking about this need for approval today. And I see people who, let's say, have failed something. And yeah, the truth is they have failed. And Satan loves to twist that and say, you're a failure now. That tiny twist that really gets you. <laughs> Um, and as we kind of look at this and identify what's the counterfeit, the only way to know what the counterfeit is is to know the truth. And the way to know the truth is to know, I'm going to pull Doug Butler here, what's in this, right? What's in the Bible? <laughs> so as we see this concept of the, the devil may masquerade as an angel of light, but I know that my God created light. And I know that in the end, spoiler alert, 10 out of 10 times, the truth is going to win. So be vigilant, be prepared, but don't be afraid. Thank you, Katie. Oh. Kids, you may be dismissed. If you have offering, you can do it online. Bye, Ella. Thanks. You can do, thank you. You can do it in the black box as well. Thanks, Katie. That's actually a really good, uh, really good point because... We think of that, that, you know, taking a truth and spinning it just a little bit, making a lie, and how much we can roll onto that lie. And I don't know if you guys are aware, it's, uh, it's Mental Health Awareness Month here in May, and I heard about that, and it's been something close to our family in the last few weeks. And I guess part of it is just a plea on one hand, if you are wrestling with something and you think, man, I, I can't get past it, you know, Katie's team, we have, we have people here who specialize in that, please talk to somebody. Um, therapy, counseling, just somebody. I know people look at us and think, hey, you know, the Meharas, we, we spent a year and a half on our own walking through and just working through issues that we needed. So please, please, please don't let it get to a point where you take a lie or a mistruth and roll it into something else. And uh, it was interesting because uh, I get to play with some people here in the church and we had a, we had a practice Monday night and we were sitting down and it just wasn't going smooth. And, and Katie was part of it. And if you heard her testimony on Easter, we all just kind of like sat at one moment, and we just said, hey, well, I think we're, we're just under some serious spiritual attack. Like mental health things going around, all of this stuff, but we're just not. And we just had a moment. We just, as a group, just prayed. And, and out of that came kind of just worship. We all had our instruments, and we just could play worship. And uh, this is one of those songs that, that we did. And it was just, it, it reminded we haven't done this here in a while. But the next two songs, we're talking about feeling accepted and feeling all those things. And I think, you know, we need 
so much of of God. And sometimes it just takes a moment of just stepping back and saying, you know, wait, wait, there's a lot of confusion and mistruths out there. I'm going to take a step back and look at the truth. And, um, and so that was where I, when I was thinking through the set list for today and kind of praying about it, the whole idea of uh, just, just we need help. And it's okay to ask for help. And so I hope this blesses you guys. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you Sin runs deep. As we continue to give our tithes and our offerings this morning, we need you so much, God. And to some of us, that's pretty scary. Some of us, that's terrifying how much we need you or we need to get help or talk to somebody. But God, something that you've proven over and over and over is your faithfulness and your goodness to us. 
and that while we need you so much, God, all our lives you have been faithful. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good.
incredible truth that we can look back into our own lives and testify that. All our lives you have been faithful. And it hasn't always been pretty, Lord, and the, the, the enemy of you, the prince of this earth who has ruined your, just ruined things, God, and his goal is to seek, kill, and destroy. Sometimes it doesn't work out quite like we thought. But at the end of the day and at the end of days, we're going to look back and say, God, all our lives you have been faithful. For that person in this room right now who is just at the end, has nothing left to give. Meet them here right now, Father. For that person who this day, Mother's Day, is not a, a fun day. Would you accept them? Press your peace on their hearts that, you, that they would know your love right now in this moment. Your goodness is running after us. You're not holding back. Lord, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rudy. Um, going with the theme of <clears throat> May being Mental Health Month, um, we are very privileged and honored to have two therapists uh, in our congregation. So I'd like Cheryl to stand up and Katie to stand up. These are two therapists in our congregation, our small little congregation. Yeah, can you give them a hand. Yeah. Um, if you need help, if you need help with mental health issues, go to these two. They can get you connected with resources to help you take that next step. Uh, that you may need to take uh, to deal with some of the things that we're dealing with in our day and age. You know, we're, um, as we deal with the, this new normal, and I know everybody hates that term, uh, but it is really a new normal, um, we're being tested. People have been dealing with trauma these last two years, and we've done the best we can. I mean, people are tired, people are discouraged. People are frustrated. People are worried. And, and I'm sure Cheryl and Katie can attest to this. I know that I've had lots and lots of people in my office struggling and trying to deal with the issues that, that we're dealing with, um, some that are related to COVID and, and the crisis that it has created, and some um, not related to that. And so uh, when I've been praying about this particular series and you know, this is a series that is a hard one to preach, okay, because it's like every week you and I are getting pounded, all right? It's just the way it is, and the, the, the thing is, is that um, Satan does not want you to hear this, okay? Satan is doing everything he can to keep you from here. Satan is doing everything possible to distract you right now because he does not want you to be turning to Jesus. He does not want you to be tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to continue to flounder. And this series is really about helping you to, to regain your focus and, and to take a look at really what you need to be looking at what the Bible says you need to be looking at. And so I really want to encourage you, as we think about this and as we work through this, please don't take this uh, and think, oh, wow, pastor's just drilling us every single week, all right? Don't, I don't want you to think that, all right? I want you to take the principles of what Jesus is saying to these people, and I want you to apply them to yourselves, because it will help you. It will help you to be able to cope in a more effective way in these days and, and, and the, the crises that we're faced with. It also gives you confidence. It helps you to realize that, hey, I can face and address and deal with things that are difficult, and, and I can be victorious with it. We don't have to be 
walking around and acting like and feeling like we're defeated. Even when things are not going our way. Even when things are not being answered the way we're praying for it. God still cares and God is still involved and God is still strengthening you and helping you. And so when I look at our culture and I see the coping skills that they're trying to figure out and they're trying to use. You know what's interesting about it? It has nothing to do with God. They're trying to cope with the crisis without God, and I hope and pray that none of you are trying to do that because that's an empty street. That's an empty pursuit. Now, I understand why people don't go to God. I understand why people who don't go to church and are not Christians don't go to God. Maybe, maybe it's a past pain that caused them to be, have a closed mind. Or maybe for others it's a failure of a pastor. Or maybe it's the sense of pride that I can figure it out. For others it's, it's making the same mistake over and over and over again. And, and they, they keep making them and they're refusing to try anything new. As our coping skills have failed as a culture, one by one, we've begun to rely on some of these desires as sort of a last grasp of trying to make sense of it or trying to gain strength or somehow deal with our emotional state of of where we are. The first week that we talked about, we talked about the desire for comfort. Hoping to stay in our comfort zone. We all like that. You know, we all like it where it's safe. We all like it where we don't have to risk anything. We all like it where we can just stay where we don't have to get outside of that comfort zone. But you need to understand it. As long as you stay in that comfort zone, you're not going to experience God like you could when you're walking by faith. We also talked about it's not thinking through the cost. It's making a rash decision. That's what that guy did. It's also choosing comfort over commitment, saying, I'm going to take the easy road instead of the committed road. Last week, we looked at the desire for control and wanting to do things my way and delaying instead of proceeding and choosing right versus Jesus. And we talked about that. I've got a lot of emails from that, that whole concept of choosing right and choosing Jesus because that must have really resonated with many of you, because that's the decisions that we're making every single day. And so this week, we look at the desire for approval and how we use this desire to excuse away our following Jesus. So open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. That's where we've been the last couple weeks. We're going to take a look at verses 61 and 62, two simple verses, Luke chapter 9, verses 61 and 62, and I'm going to do this. If you're there and you got it in your scripture, raise your hand. If you got it, okay, Luke chapter 9, verses 61 and 62. Okay, all right, it looks like most everybody's got it. All right, here we go. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Two simple little verses, but they're power-packed, all right? So let's take a look at the three pieces of the desire for approval, that excuse. The first piece is the man desired to go back and say goodbye to his family. So here we go. We have this, uh, this, another man approaches Jesus, just like the first guy. He approaches Jesus, and he says, hey, I'd like to follow you. And, And just like the second guy, all right, So two out of the three guys, they have an excuse. They have a a reason. They, they, They have a reason why they can't follow Jesus right at that moment. He says he wants to go back and say goodbye to his family first. Now, compared to the second guy, this was a much shorter delay. Because as we talked last week, the guy who was wanted to go bury his father, that could have been months or years. But this person, he just wanted to go back and say goodbye to his family, which was a much shorter delay. But then I got to thinking, as I was reading through this and preparing this series and thinking about this, why was it so important for this man to go back and say goodbye to his family? Why was that so important? And Jesus' response actually gives us, I think, a little insight. 
because there was hesitancy to this man's offer to follow Jesus. Maybe it was because he was scared. He was, he was out there on the edge. He was outside his comfort zone, and he's like, uh-oh. Okay? It's like sometimes when people make a decision for Christ, and then they go home, and they're like, oh, what did I do? You know, what, what commitment did I make? You know? and, so, and so maybe it was, it was that he was scared, or maybe that he wasn't all in. It was just words. He really wanted to stay in the stands and watch. He didn't want to get into the game. And all of a sudden he says, hey, yeah, I'll play. I'll get into the game. And then he's like, oh, what did I just say? Oh, man, what, what am I doing? Maybe that was it. Or maybe he needed reassurance from his family. Maybe he just needed his family to say, hey, you know what? You're, you're doing the right thing to help him feel better about his decision. No matter what the reason, there is a delay for this man wanting to follow Jesus. So how do you know that you're making the right decision? How do you know if God is saying something to you and calling you, how do you know that it's really God? And in fact, it's sort of interesting, that question came up in our life group this week that I was at. And it reminded me of the story Bob Mumford, uh, in Take Another Look at Guidance, compares discovering God's will with the sea captain's uh, um, docking procedure. A certain harbor in Italy can be reached only by sailing up a narrow channel between dangerous rocks and a submerged bank. Over the years, many ships have wrecked and navigation is hazardous. To guide the ship safely into port, there are three lights who have been mounted on three huge poles in the harbor. And when all three lights are perfectly lined up and seen as one, the ship can safely proceed up the narrow channel. If the pilot sees sees two or three lights, he knows he's off course and he's in danger. And God has provided three beacons to guide us, to guide us in the decisions that we're trying to make, the things that we're trying to discern, what is God actually saying to me? And these three harbor lights of guidance are, first of all, the word of God. That's the objective standard. The word of God has plenty to say about what we should be doing, giving us principles about how we should be living, the things that we should be valuing. The second is the Holy Spirit. That's the subjective witness. That's the sense of the Holy Spirit moving within us. That's the sense of of the confirmation when we're trying to decide what we're supposed to be doing. We're praying about it. We're seeking God. And sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks very loudly, and you can't miss it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks very quietly, and you said, can you say that again? Yeah, right. That's what we're saying to the Holy Spirit. And the third thing, the third light, is the circumstances. Sometimes the circumstances open right up and we see, oh, this is the way we're supposed to go. Now, we don't base it just on circumstances. We don't base it just on how we're feeling the Holy Spirit is what he's saying to us. Uh, we We could base it just on the Bible, but we really need all three of those lights to line up so that we can know what God is asking us to do. Now, you can imagine how off course you can get when we replace my will with what the Holy Spirit is saying or seeking approval from others for seeking what the Bible says or for forcing circumstances to work for letting God work through the circumstances. We can get off course like that. We do that today all the time, and we have to be careful. We look for what our friends say about it. We look at what our family says. We look at what the culture says. We look at what our neighbors say. We look at what social media says. Please don't look at social media to make your decisions, all right? Don't do that. And that's what this man was doing. He was, he was, he was looking at everything else but Jesus. He wanted confirmation. He was seeking approval. And his lights were not li- lining up because of that. And he was about to make a wrong decision. He had a desire to go back and say goodbye to his family. The second piece of this desire for approval excuse is the the man's desire was a distraction that caused him to delay. This man's desire to go home and say goodbye to his family was a distraction. Jesus 
uh, uses the example of plowing a field and looking away as you're going. And you can imagine what that looks like. See, a farmer cannot do that. When a farmer is plowing, he needs to be focused on where he's going, not where he's been. He cannot let other things distract him from where he's going or he's going to have all kinds of problems. When I was 15 years old, uh, there was a farmer at our church, and he, he needed some help. So I went to, the, uh, to, to his farm, and he was teaching me the farm life, and he was teaching me some things. And one day he said, you know, you've been working long enough. I was like 15 years old. He said, I want you to jump on this tractor, and I want you to cultivate this, this, uh, this uh, field of corn. So I got up on the tractor, and he went out there with me, and he said, okay, this is, this is what you need to do. So there's this metal pole that's, that hangs down. You line that up with the row of corn, as long, and you make sure that stays on the row of corn, and you'll be fine. If you don't line up that corn, you're going to take out six rows of corn, and I won't be happy. And I said, yes, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. All right, I'll do it. And so I'm, I'm driving in the field. And, and I was doing this for about a half hour, and all of a sudden I see him flying in his truck coming up, and like this, I'm going, what did I do? I'm looking back, because after I stopped the tractor, and, and I, you know, I hadn't taken out a lot of corn, and he, he, he runs up, stops, and goes, are you in a hurry? And I was like, uh, am I going too fast? He goes, yeah, don't go so fast. I said, okay. All right, so I, I geared it down a little bit, and, and you know, because cultivating corn, you know, it's, it's, uh, six different blades that are going between the corn and it's cultivating and stirring up the soil between the rows of the corn. So I'm doing this and I'm going along and everything like this and all of a sudden I see this storm coming. Like in the west it was getting really dark, you know. And I'm, I'm driving along and I'm you know, sort of looking like this, looking like this. And then all of a sudden I hear th- the thunder start to come and the wind starts blowing. And, and, and as it got closer and closer I started looking a little bit more and more and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, you know, it's like one of those, like, when you've been driving, like, for a half hour and you don't remember what the last hour, half hour was. That was a little bit like what I was feeling and experiencing. And I stopped the tractor and I turned around and there were six rows of corn completely gone, all right, because I wasn't watching the steak. The farmer was not happy with me. He was not happy. But it, at that moment, there was a distraction. It was the storm. And I got my eyes off of what I was supposed to be looking on. And that's what this man was allowing to happen. He was distracted by his desire for approval. He wanted people to pat him on the back. He wanted people to say, hey, attaboy. He wanted people to celebrate him and his big decision. He wanted people to notice him. He wanted his family to say, everything's going to be all right. Even if it's a bad decision, it's going to be okay. We are exactly the same, aren't we? Our culture is the same. Unfortunately, sometimes our churches are the same. You see, our, our culture will give you and me approval if we say the right things, if we're politically correct, if we agree with the rest of what the culture is teaching, if there are other people coming with us or agreeing with us. Sometimes our churches are the same way. Christians will give approval if, if we're all going to the in church uh, where everyone else is going or we're going to cool churches that have cool things. If we say the right thing, if, if we're doing the right thing, uh, if we're protesting the right causes, all of a sudden we're accepted. We have approval. If your three lights are lined up, you know what? You don't need people's approval. You don't need it. If you're doing what the Bible says, if you're listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying, and you're looking at your circumstances that God has given, and all three of those line up, go for it! Don't hesitate. Don't hold back. I would submit to you today that if those three lights are lined up like that, you're going to find people who are going to disagree with you. You are, because you're going against culture. You're going against the flow of where everyone else is going. Don't get distracted by what other people say. Don't get distracted by wanting people to agree with you. Don't get distracted by desiring for people to cheer you on. 
Don't get distracted by wishing that people would tell you that you're doing the right thing or that they would notice what you're doing. Do you know what we call that? We call that leadership. We call that leadership. It's saying God is calling you to do this, and it agrees with the Bible, and the Holy Spirit is in agreement, and your circumstances are falling into place. The Bible was telling this man to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit was telling this man to follow Jesus. The circumstances were right in front of him. Can you imagine that? You're standing physically in front of Jesus and you're saying, hey, I want to follow you and Jesus is in agreement. And you say, uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to go back here and say goodbye to my family first. Can you imagine that? The man's desire was a distraction that caused him to delay. The third piece of this desire for approval excuse is following Jesus demands all our strength and all our focus. Jesus says, no one puts his hand to the plow. That takes strength. Plowing has not changed much in Palestine in the last 3,000 years, I'm told, as I've researched this. A plow has a wood frame and a metal piece that has a point and is flared out. It's not to turn the soil over, it's to stir the soil, loosen it. Steers and castrated oxen uh, were the most common animals used for plowing. Generally, two animals were used to pull a plow, and they used a yoke that kept the two animals together. The communication to these animals were critical and took a lot of strength and a lot of focus. Plowing required a lot of strength and a lot of focus, but Jesus makes an interesting statement to this man. He says, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. Jesus says that we don't use all the strength and the focus to follow Jesus, then we're not fit for the kingdom of God. We're not fit for the service of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says that when we don't use all our strength and our focus to follow him, we're not fit. The Greek word for fit actually means well-placed or appropriate. The Greek word translated service in the kingdom means this. Those who announce the near approach of the kingdom describe its nature and set forth the conditions of obtaining citizenship in it. This just isn't any kind of kingdom. It's God's kingdom. If you desire to have approval and that causes you to look back and sacrificing your strength and your focus, you are not appropriate to announce, describe, and set forth the conditions of of obtaining citizenship in God's kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. It takes tremendous amount of strength to go against the flow of culture, to go alone. It takes a tremendous amount of focus to go against the crowd. It's going to cost you something. Don't think that you can just follow Jesus in your spare time. It's going to cost you something. You'll be rejected. Maybe you'll be made fun of. Maybe you'll be excluded. Maybe you'll be unwanted. Maybe you'll be abandoned. But isn't that what Jesus told us, that if we're going to follow him, that's going to happen to us? I mean, didn't he say, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, Matthew 10, 33? Didn't he say that? So why would we expect anything different? Do you notice when Jesus was talking about being fit, he never talked about how much you know. He never talked about how perfect you are. He never talked about how many Bible verses you've memorized. Being willing to follow Jesus no matter the cost is the only requirement. Seeking the approval of the master first. A young man once studied violin under a world-renowned master, and eventually the time came for the student's first recital. Following each section, despite the cheers of the crowd, the performer seemed dissatisfied. 
Even after the last number, with the shouts louder than ever, the talented violinist stood watching an old man in the balcony. Finally, the elderly man smiled and nodded in approval, and immediately the young man relaxed and beamed with happiness. You see, the man in the balcony was his teacher, and thus the applause of the crowd meant nothing to him until he had first won the heart approval of the master. You see, following Jesus demands all our strength and all our focus. As we conclude this morning, it's hard not to be liked, especially if you have a personality that's outgoing. That's a tough one. It's hard to have to go it alone. It's hard to, to be rejected. It's hard to not receive applause. It's hard not to have approval. But when we follow Jesus, we will be giving up many of those things. And that's one of the things that many of us fear the most. And that's what makes the church amazing. Because the church is when we gather together in a safe place. It's an encouraging place. It's a supportive place. It's a place where we can have refuge. It's a place where we can come together and help each other. And it's even a place where we can go and learn and discern what God is saying to us. You know, it's interesting when horses and donkeys are attacked, they react totally different. When horses are attacked, they actually face their enemy and stand in a circle. And all they get done doing is when they start kicking their enemy is all they end up doing is kicking each other. Sounds a lot like our culture. But donkeys, donkeys do it totally different. Donkeys, when they're attacked by, the, the, uh, by an enemy, they put all their heads in a circle. And when the, that threat comes, they start kicking. They don't kick each other. They kick the enemy. That's the way the church is supposed to be. That's the way we're supposed to be with each other. And so we never have to really have to do it all by ourselves. We never have to live all by ourselves because we have the body of Christ coming together. And so when you see those little prayer requests that go out, there are people praying for you. And some of our people forward it on to other people. We need to understand we're not alone. We are a part of a family, and we come together, and, and we can encourage and support each other. Jesus met a man who, who told Jesus that he would follow him, but he had a condition. That condition was that he needed approval. The man desired to go back and say goodbye to his family. It's nice when people agree with us of what we've decided to do. The man's desire was a distraction that caused him to delay. Our desire for approval can distract us from Jesus' call on our life. Following Jesus demands all our strength and focus. It's hard not to desire approval, and it requires all our focus and all our strength. You know why? Because a lot of people feel like, if I don't have approval, I can't live. If I don't have approval, I can't survive. It was October 14th, 2003. The Chicago Cubs were playing the Florida Marlins in the National League Championship Series. This game broke my heart. The Cubs were in Wrigley Field, and the Cubs were uh, up three games to two. The score was 3 nothing in the eighth inning with one out, and it looked like the Cubs were finally going to go to the World Series for the first time since 1945. Marlins hitter Luis Castillo hit a foul ball down the left field line, and several fans reached out to catch the ball, but Steve Bartman was the one that caught the ball. Cubs left fielder Moise Alou was furious because he thought he could catch the ball, and instead of the Cubs having two out, the Cubs had a meltdown and gave up eight runs to lose the game six, and the next night they lost game seven, and the Marlins went to the World Series. Immediately, the Cubs fans turned on Steve Bartman. They booed him. They threatened him. He had to actually be removed from the stadium by police for his own safety. There was no bigger Cubs fan than Steve Bartman, but his fellow Cub fans turned against him. And in the days and the weeks and months, Steve had to have police protection at his house because it was out on social media where he lived and where he worked. 
There was no man who was hated more than Steve Bartman at that moment. What did Steve Bartman do in those days, weeks, and months after this incident? He went to work. He apologized, and he went to work. Each day he went to work, whether he was hated or not. He returned to his quiet life, and the tide eventually changed, and Cub fans began to feel bad about the way they treated him, and he never allowed for the focus to be on him. He used all his focus and all his strength to live a quiet, respectful life. In 2016, when the Cubs finally won the World Series, the Cubs gave Steve Bartman a World Series ring trying to reach out and solve the issue. Steve Bartman proved that it, we don't need approval. We don't need approval to live. We need to focus and have strength and move when God says move. The problem with this man who wanted to say goodbye to his family was that he was more concerned about seeking approval from his family than he was seeking approval from Jesus. Jesus is the only one we need to have approval from. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for showing us that you indeed need to have first place in our lives. That we need to seek your approval first. And Lord, that's hard to do. It takes faith, it takes strength, it takes focus. And so Lord, I just pray that you help us this week. Help us to stay focused on your approval, not other people's approval, because other people's approval is fickle. It comes and goes, but you don't. So, Lord, I pray that you give us strength and you give us focus. If there's something that we need to change in our life, Lord, help us to make that commitment and do it and share it with our life group. If there's something that we need to start doing, Lord, help us to do that and share that with our life group so that we can support and encourage each other as we continue to walk together, following you more completely. We thank you so much for this. And all God's people said, amen. You know, amen, amen means I agree, right? All right. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for watching us live. And uh, we'll see you next week. Same station, same time.